this is this is how I want to be. I want to be able to bring across information in a manner that's clear and concise and people can get what it is that I'm trying to say. So it's an ongoing um, work progress and um, I wanted to, um, I hope that I'm living up to that. Um, his work has really helped me wake up to the reality of how, and in my case, how energy is negotiated in our region in the Southwest and in particular on Black Mesa. And who, it's waking me to who the players are, who the major decision makers are, and the reason that they're making these decisions. And so even though it's being presented to our people, in like in the case of Navajo Generating Station, that this is going to bring jobs and revenues to the tribe, there's always something more behind that. And so that's something that we have to look for in the research and in the work that we do um, with the people that um, we're dealing with. It's made me look at even our allies. We work with non-native environmental groups. And sometimes the way that they began is not always you know, we're some, some, in the beginning, you know, we were naive and we think, okay, we're all on the same side. These non-Indian enviro groups are all with us and they want what's good for us and what's right for us. Well, it's because of Mr. Red House that I really woke up to the fact that that's not always the case. That there's also other, that they, they also have agendas that they're working towards. And those don't always um, align with ours, and that they want to protect the environment and don't necessarily want to do it the way we want to do it. And so I can't express enough how much it's really made everything full circle for me and brought, made everything make more sense to me. Um, so I want to say um, that much about John Rittenhouse um, to begin with. Um, I live just south of Body Coal Company and um, about 15 years ago I came home and, um, and uh, started building a house. And uh, I walked down to the, the, one of the springs near my home and boy, uh, ten years goes by, you're off to school like the way people tell you to do, and you come back and there wasn't an answer for why the spring near where I lived and where I had just decided to build a home was now gone. And then I realized, talking to NTUA and all these people, that I wasn't going to get water for like probably 20 years. And I, and I wasn't going to get electricity for like maybe 20 years. So I still live in an area where we have electricity now for about 15 years. But plumbing is just something that we're not going to see for quite a while in um, running water. So we're still people who uh, today, uh, I don't want to make it seem like we've done this all this time, but we now haul water from some community well to where we live and we really have to conserve the water carefully and uh, use it in a way which, uh, you know, prioritize our use of it. And taking a bath is kind of like three or four down the line in priority. So uh, washing and drinking, drinking is actually the first priority and washing our dishes is probably like close second or third. So, and, and that's, I'm very conscious of that, and so that's the way I live. And so even though um, I work in Pinyon and uh, um, have um, just been living in um, teachers there for just a few years now, I'm still very conscious of how I use the, my resources. But at the time I built my house, one of the things that came to my mind was, how am I going to live here? I, it, it just became a, a huge reality that I was now raising children and <clears throat> their future just kind of flashed before my eyes and I thought, if I don't, if I can't live here, then what am I going to do? 
I just came back from the city. I came here thinking I'm going to do something here. Am I going to go back to the city? Am I going to go to the border town? If I go to the border town, then I come home on weekends. And I watch my family struggle. My family is still sheep herders, um, farmers. I'm a farmer. They're weavers. Uh, they very much enjoy the life that they live. Uh, I grew up never knowing that this was a hardship way of life, that there was, uh, and grew up knowing it was hard, but we loved all of it. We knew where our food came from, we knew where our water came from, we knew where the corn came from, uh, you know, we knew where all our the elements, the, these things that sustain us, we knew where they came from. They didn't come from bashes, they didn't come from somewhere else where, you know, we knew where they came from. Uh, I had grown up with relocation all my life, so what John Redhouse said about activism, accidental activism, I think that happened to me, and I just became this person that was now struggling for my livelihood. Even though I had two degrees under my belt, those didn't mean a thing. So today when I go to the communities, I never say I have a, a degree in this and a degree in that and, you know, and try to say I have been educated in the Western way. What I do try to convey to, to our, our people and our elders is that, look, this is what you taught me about our, our culture and our way of life. These are the things you told me it's important. These are the offerings you told me that I have to make. This is the way that my relationship to the water. This is my relationship to the earth, Shumana Hassan, my mother. This is my relationship to the water, Shumana Hassan, my mother. This is my relationship to the fire. I'm the keeper of this fire stick, the fire poker. I'm the one that has to decide the destiny of my children, and therefore I need to prepare my prayers in that way. Now, how is that going to guide us to, for this next generation? And what's the cause of this water situation that we're facing? The cause, of course, goes back to the mining industry that began in our neighborhood about four decades ago. And the more we research, and once again through Mr. Red House's work, we found out that the entire state of energy is being held hostage um, by, the, by the state of Arizona. And how energy begins, the, the, the beginning of the source of the energy began in Black Mesa. And the coal was being dug and the water, pristine groundwater supported the mining. That coal went to Navajo generating station. That electricity was sent down south. That electricity piped the water from the pump it, water from the Colorado River to Phoenix and Tucson. It was tightly connected. The coal was committed to one place. The electricity is committed to one place. The Navajo Nation signed these leases and contracts that were ne not necessarily in the best interest of, of the nation, especially today. As the nation got bigger, the, the, the royalties didn't get bigger. As the nation got bigger, the benefits to the nation actually diminished. We're at this point where we re have this opportunity to renegotiate. At the time they were originally negotiated, you know, jobs were promised, you know, people were told this is temporary, minimal impacts would be made, this much could go to uh, the local um, tribal um, college, and so on and so forth. Today, we have this opportunity, I think, I believe, to realign those lease agreements with what is more Dinet. Something that's essentially not going to degrade the environment because through this entire four decade process, we've seen a lot of degradation of the environment, the air, the water, and that's a huge cost to the people. We're not people who they can relocate and, and send to Albuquerque buy us all houses and we'd be living here. Uh, that's just not going to happen. We have a reservation that was given to us, our lands given to us through this treaty, and you know, you've got to take care of it. And I think
think that's the bottom line. Um, what I see, uh, what we're essentially working towards is basically a future that's not based on the destruction of the environment. The technology's there, the renewable technology's there. We've got to figure out a way to do this in which there's not a huge cost to the health of the people and to the environment of the people. When we're talking about the future of the people, we're also talking about clean air and clean water and productive lands. That's just not going to happen if you have land that's toxic from mining. You're not going to be able to farm there, grow corn, and have healthy corn. All the metal, heavy metals and the toxins are going to be inside that food that you're trying to grow. So you've got to do this. We have the opportunity to do it right. And I think that opportunity is upon us now. And so we just had 800 miners and NGS workers um, lobby the Napa Nation just recently. And what's really concerning to me is that they are thinking about themselves and their livelihood, which is very important. But we're talking about something broader. We're talking about the lives and the health of many people and the natural elements, life-giving elements of life, uh, of life. And so we're talking about broader, something broader than what they're, what they're trying to fight for. What they, I think they don't understand is that we're all on the same side. They're concerned about their livelihood. We're concerned about finding an alternative to what's happening here. If we destroy our homelands, Nothing's going to live. And everybody's going to be running away from the places that we uh, create as super fun sites. And everybody's going to be trying to find places upwind from the coal ash and upwind from the toxic pollution. And, you know, we have to think about those things too. So, um, I think that. Um, when we're doing this work, just one last thing, I know when time is up, but one last thing I want to say is that I mentioned this earlier in the workshop that I had, is that when we're doing this kind of work, it's crucial that we're looking at the research and the data and fishing for everything that's out there. At the same time, we're constantly looking to the medicine people and the traditional teachings and using that as a guiding force to how we're going to strategize and how we're going to build this new vision for our future. A lot of people say, you know, that's a backward way of life that you're wanting. You want to go back to sheep camp and sheep herding and farming? That's backwards. And I was telling an important leader just this week, I went to the Midwest. People there farm 500 acres of land and have animals in their backyard and grow their own beef. You can't tell me that's a backward way of life. This way that I'm fighting for. We have to eat. What's wrong with me growing my own food? Do I have to let Monsanto or Frito Lay or whoever Safeway be the one to put food on my table? Why, why is it wrong that I want to put my own food on my own table? What's wrong with that? Oops. Every day, somebody's driving through Black Mesa wanting a sheep, either for their family to eat or some ceremony they're putting on. Every day, somebody's driving through looking for blue corn or white corn or yellow corn because, you know, Certain types of food specifically are made in these different types. I said, I said, where are you envisioning for us to go that you're saying this? And he basically pulled back and said, well, you know, I have to look at all the sides. So I think grassroots people, uh, vir uh, environmental people, I've really put a lot of thought to this. I'm thinking about things are creative, innovative, really, really thinking about the future.
center and articulating in a way that really needs to be heard. And I think that that's one of the things we're doing is we're keeping the tradition, we're using the tradition to guide us. We're using the research to help support us. And we're just trying to forge a way into the future which we're not destroying ourselves while we're doing it, or our neighbor, our relatives. It's kind of like, okay, let's choose how many of your relatives you want to, you know, take out, while how many of you want to continue forward. It's not like that if we all want to go in that direction. So, um, thank you for your time. Um, I asked to be first because um, I... I'm dealing with a family situation at this time, and so I want to be back tomorrow morning for um, um, for for actually for a funeral. So um, I thank you for your time, and I think really appreciate this audience here. And I just want to mention real quickly that Kli is um, Shinalik. We come from the same area of Black Mesa, so um, and he's doing great work as well. So go on and ahead, all of you. So I learned a lot 
that, during that, we, we, uh, we lost a lot <laughs> in that battle, although there is no skier <coughs> on our Taylor, and uh, there is no second skier in the San Diego. And then when we, when we decided to move up north to northern New Mexico, I, kind of, I was able to bring a lot that I learned from, from the political activity um, down in the, closer to Albuquerque and the relationships that have been formed there. And we actually um, formed another watershed community up in um, the Penasco area and it was actually instigated by the folks at Piperty's Pueblo because they were concerned about activity in the upper watershed that was going to affect the water as it flows through the Pueblo. So, and it was a land grant community, so uh, the Espana community got involved, a lot of the Ezequiel people got involved, they were concerned about water use and maintaining uh, not only quantity but quality of water in the, in the communities up there. And out of, it was just kind of a, I'd already written for several alternative newspapers along the way. I don't know, do any of you remember Sears Catalog from the South Valley? Or North, I guess it was put out, the people who ran it were in the North Valley, but it was spelled S-E-E-R. Yes. And they did, they started out doing a lot of work on the uranium uh, exploration on the Navajo Nation and out in the, in the grants area. So I got involved with them, and so I just continued to write, and as, as the, the watershed group up in the North got more and better organized, it became obvious that there needed to be a, a voice, there needed to be a medium for not only to advocate for, for uh, the communities, but also as a forum for people to be involved. And so we started La Higuerita News, it was called back then, and it was a hard copy monthly newspaper, and it was all put together by a um, very small group of folks, but it was a small group of folks who did that editing and publishing, but who were part of a much, much larger group of folks. And uh, we also, as she was talking about what came down, this was mostly during the mid-1990s, and what was going on there again was um, trying to deal and protect access to resources from, uh, for the local communities. And, not only did we end up fighting the forces, we ended up fighting urban environmentalists. And there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of hangings and effigy. There were a lot of um, demonstrations. There was a it was a pretty critical time. And the, but fortunately, those people who had developed these relationships, who lived in the communities, who were Anglo, understood what was at stake and. So there was kind of a, at one point some of us started not calling ourselves environmentalists anymore because they had such a, a negative connotation in terms of urban environmentalists trying to impose their kind of a biocentric view of uh, what the communities uh, were fighting for. And so that was during the 1990s and La Higuerita boy got right involved and uh, uh, managed to Piss a lot of people off along the way, but also to, I think, fill a, a much needed void in these issues that really weren't being covered in the corporate, in the corporate press. So, in terms of what's been, and now uh, that we have the paper, a hard copy that we distributed in, across northern New Mexico for 15 years, and um, my partner, Mark Schiller, um, died in 2010. So I didn't know whether I was going to be able to continue it. But fortunately, I hooked up with David Correa and a couple of other folks, and we decided that it was going to segue into an online journal. And I felt badly in some regard because um, Roxanne was on our mailing list. She got her monthly copy. Um, I felt bad that we <coughs> left print journalism we had to give it up, but I also felt like I just, I couldn't, I couldn't manage it. Dave is down in Albuquerque and affiliated with the university, and it just seemed, uh, you know, that, that's what the profession is. So we went online. And it's been, it's been good. I mean, we've, I can't believe how many um, people I've, I've now come in contact with through the dissemination online. You know, it's open to comment. and. Um, 
we cover a broad range of issues, again, from all the years that we spent, I spent as a political activist and as a journalist um, covering the issues with Los Alamos National Laboratory, all the nuclear uh, manufacturing nuclear bombs there. We've extensively covered oh, the uh, uranium, um, the threat of more developed uranium in the grants area. We've covered, we still cover a lot of forest issues. The Forest Service is in terrible shape, and as you know, our forests are in terrible shape. And a lot of folks are trying to figure out um, what to do. And again, it's coming down to the people who know the forest and who are involved and live in, live in the forest um, are the ones who are going to have to take things in hand and determine how we're going to make healthy forests again. The Forest Service, we fought them for years and years, and now that they don't have any money, maybe it's going to be easier to kind of work around the Forest Service. But again, it's going to take money. It's going to take a lot of work. Um, we cover raising issues. One of the, Eric Schultz, who's been working as one of the co-editors, has been covering the, the controversy on the Biosecurity <coughs> Unit about access to raising that the district has reduced the, the level that, of cow that can graze in, in a couple of the associations, so we're working on that. And David has been covering uh, a lot of what's been going on with the Albuquerque. Police Department, which I'm sure you're aware of, and we've been doing a great job with that. And um, what am I missing? <laughs> so just a real gamut of environmental and social justice issues. And I guess trying to answer the question of, of where we're going to go and to try and deal with this is, I guess I have to stress that uh, relationships are the most critical. And to be an, to be an activist, you have to you have to really be involved in the community, maintain the relationships that you've developed over all those years. And um, also, you don't want to preach to the choir, so you have to get that voice out there, and that's where the media comes in. And, and if, you can, if you can speak uh, for those and who, who are doing the organizing, but also those who just want to live and, in these communities, and like, like she was saying, maintain a way of life that has been um, lived for hundreds of years in these communities in, in northern New Mexico. She again says, you know, what we're struggling for is to keep, put the water to beneficial use, to use that secular water to grow food, to maybe develop some niche crops that you can sell on the market, to make, to make people, to allow people to continue to live on the land in northern New Mexico, be it on the pueblos or on the, in the land grant communities. But as the, as the water I, we cover a lot of water issues. That's a big one I shouldn't be now. Um, as the water becomes uh, more and more of a market commodity, the, the communities up north are going to be more and more important uh, figuring into how to keep that water from the land. Did you give me a time? No. Um, okay. Uh, so that, that is, I guess, my look to the future. We have to figure out again how to not romanticize the past, but how to figure out how to save and maintain, because uh, I hate, I don't like to use the word preserve, because we're not preserving anything, we're maintaining a way of life and, uh, and allow people to um, grow their own food, cut their own firewood, build their own houses, make their own abilities. And those people who can act as a buffer to the suburbanization and urbanization of of the country. I mean, that's where we are. We're sitting up there on the way. Okay, so my name is Laura, and like I said before, or as I was introduced, I'm from the Scottish Creek Nation, and most people probably know the backstory, but I'm going to tell it. So we're originally from the southeast, and we were comprised of 50 autonomous tribal towns. And then through federal Indian policy, we were displaced to Oklahoma, where we are now. And as we were displaced, um, they carried embers from the ceremonial grounds and reestablished place. But um, so part of what came with, with that being displaced is that we were removed from from our original lands. Um, 
but a lot of the areas that we resettled still resemble the woodlands from home. We still practice our dances and that sort of thing. Um, I will say that there are two explicit factions within our nation. We have um, your traditional stomp dance folks and you have um, your Christian folks that are Baptist, Methodist, and I would say that the stomp dance folks are very tolerant of the Christians, but it doesn't go the other way around. And within our tribal government, um, actually our seal is based on a scripture from the Bible. So um, I come into my work not really having a lot of faith in in our tribe, in our tribal government, and so kind of picking up on this idea of um, sovereignty, which I'm going to address in a moment, but I kind of want to start first with, you know, after kind of explaining my people, I want to start first with how I enter into this work. So um, there's a quote called, or that goes, when an old man dies, an entire library burns to the ground. And that's an African talker. And my work in the past has been doing oral history workshops, participatory mapping workshops, explicitly <coughs> to see tran or knowledge transfer from elders to youth, or even to capture the stories of um, our elders and their knowledge about place and just to learn about the culture and that sort of thing. And so, kind of in a past life and a current life, um, I worked and I have worked in GIS. I continue to work in GIS. I was very much a technocrat. And, but seeing how other indigenous peoples in the world were using mapping in different ways to support claims in um, in international rights regime and within their own settler colonial rights regimes, I saw that they were able to take these map oral histories and um, have their claims to the land. So Maori, um, First Nations of Canada, and they were able to enter those into court. And, um, and I saw in Australia how folk, indigenous folks, they were using more ephemeral maps, a stick in the sand to manage a pr prescribed burn over an area. So I found all of that really fascinating, and that's sort of how I entered into my work. So through my work of hearing the oral histories, bearing witness to people's stories, um, one of the things that really emerged out of that is this idea of a very fatalistic trajectory that indigenous peoples are on, and that's um, in a hundred years there won't be indigenous people or our nation will disappear, our tribe won't be here. Um, in a hundred years, we won't have our language anymore. In a hundred years, our plants will be gone. Because as I'm doing the mapping and map biographies, and, and I'm asking them, tell me where you grew up, tell me where you played. And then they're telling me, oh, we played in this stream, but it's not even a stream anymore. Or we used to fish for this particular fish, and now it's endangered. Um, or in Cherokee, North Carolina, it was we used to go and gather this particular plant, but now the National Park Service encroached upon our homeland, displaced us, and gated it off. And so, you know, you start hearing these stories and you start figuring out how to use that as claims, as evidence in a rights claim. So I come at this in two different ways as well. I come at it from a grievance model, trying to understand how to take the work and argue it and argue it well with an airtight argument in the settler colonial rights regime. But on the flip side, um, the other work is from a, a non-grievance model because I couldn't imagine myself my entire life being a fight against somebody that's oppressing me. Where is the peace that comes where we're building and pro progressing as people and building our strength? So there's the part, you know, where we had some elders speaking earlier in the day 
about, you know, we have these songs and these stories that sustain us. And so I kind of have two, two trajectories that I work in. And one is, this, again, this grievance model where I can fight if need be, and I've learned the tools to fight. And the other is a non-grievance model where, you know, learning about the stories, learning what they mean in place. And so what I was saying before, that I was hearing this common story emerge, a fatalistic trajectory that we won't be here, we'll have nothing. Um, so my key question in my work then was, what do we have to do to disrupt this path? We don't have to choose to continue on this path. What do we have to do to disrupt it? And so I was hearing this at the community level. And, and I'm speaking for my own community, um, Muskogee Creek Nation. A lot of folks didn't have or, and don't have faith in the tribal government to, to handle things for them. So I took it all on myself to basically do a study and just start asking people, where do you see the tribe in X number of years? What do, you, what do you value? And this is where the indigenous planning piece comes in. I'm a professor here in community and regional planning. So really formulating a planning approach and thinking ideologically, methodologically, and practically. How do you make it happen in practice? So ideologically, it's really identifying what is the worldview of the people? What do they value? And asking them. Um, and then methodologically, you know, I think most of us have read Linda Tui High Smith's book and this idea of decolonizing methodologies. So deploying some of those, I mean, on, there's one section where she has 20 different ideas that you can take into a community. Storytelling, bearing witness, giving testimony, I don't know, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. So my idea was how to take these decolonizing methodologies and put it in a planning process so that you can understand what do the people want. And it's not like you know your typical planning, city planning type of deal where, okay, we put up a notice, we're having a hearing, now come and sit and we're going to speak at you and come get on this microphone. And you know, a lot of indigenous people, they don't necessarily work like that. How can you even do the kind of approaches where people don't have to talk. Maybe they can write on a post-it note. And you can create a historical timeline of your community together and analyze it together. So I don't necessarily like to use this idea of bottom up, but there is like a top down kind of deal, top echelon that I see happening with tribal governments. And that's where I really wanted to situate the work that I do and the indigenous planning work and have it rooted in the community and what they value, and what their worldviews are. So, after talking with people, I did interviews, I worked with folks on, they helped me formulate a survey and ground truth it. I got about 300 surveys back, I, I gave it out at our tribal festival. And some of the key things that I saw emerge as values that are sustaining, whether you're Christian or whether you, you are a stomp dance person, and that's that people care about community, they care about helping one another, they were saying some of the same issues coming up in their communities, and that's around violence and that sort of thing. So for the work that I do, it was really trying to come up with thinking about um, how the tribe can re-articulate, the ways in which it does re-articulate a settler colonial regime. And a lot of what it does is normative governance practices that aren't necessarily approachable by the community. So what I'm getting at is that when you start talking about settler colonialism and the way that a settler is defined and a migrant is defined, a migrant is somebody that comes there with the intent not to install a new polity at the expense of the indigenous polity and governance. So the settler comes to install their own at the expense of the indigenous polity and install their own notion of sovereignty. So that's where I want to get back at sovereignty and kind of this other direction that I'm thinking of in terms of sovereignty and what I'm terming as radical sovereignty. So not something that's defined within um, our nation state regime, 
but something that can be defined within communities. Um, I know I wanted to write a chapter because Creeks like to play softball. Um, softball is sovereignty. And I really see like the articulation of um, who you are as a tribal person and how you articulate that in your daily life. I see that as sovereignty, that it doesn't have to happen within this nation state kind of context. Um, so the other thing too is the reason that I kind of spent time formulating that is because I did grow up within Creek Nation. Um, you know, I was really cognizant of planning problems in my own community because <laughs> we were talking about this in one of my classes. They built our housing, it was a HUD housing subdivision. They built it by a dump. And I've heard that come up several times that a lot of um, Indian housing subdivisions are built near dumps. And we didn't have any sense when we were kids. We're like swimming in the stream next to the dump and we never put it together. So I mean like that planning, the planning issues came up. So I have like my identity and culture and that sort of thing grounded in this place. So the other piece is the geography piece because I'm a geographer. And it's this idea that we don't have to stay tethered to the places where they assigned us. And another thing that came up was an article that we were talking about this morning with the New York Times and the migration of native people to urban areas. So we really have to think about how we're going to handle that. And so this idea of sovereignty, how does sovereignty get articulated in urban areas? So I spent the last seven years surviving in um, Los Angeles, and I only had enough money to go home once a year. So it was really difficult. Fortunately, I had my daughter, but I really had to stop and think, what does it mean to be Creek? What does it mean to be sovereign and not have to stay tethered to a place that was assigned by the settler colonial state? So those are some of the places where I see um, emerging in terms of how we think about human emancipation and liberation. How are we going to think through this geography of not being containerized to reservations and assigned spaces, but people have to make a living and live and they're migrating to urban spaces. So how are we going to kind of handle that? And how are we going to organize people there and that sort of thing? So. Trying to make that happen, and 
uh, John was out there, you know, outside the academy, so it was always a reminder when I would be tempted to just, oh, let's just, let's just, you know, build something inside here in this Smith academic department and, and forget about it. But it was, you know, it was a constant um, uh, reminder of, what, of doing the right thing. And I was thinking, you know, um, that John never had an agenda in, in the sense of a personal or a uh, career agenda. His agenda was liberation and decolonization. And I think that's what we all have to aspire to and question, you know, our career goals and every, the choices we make because it's so easy in this country to rationalize and go toward the money, go toward the, the celebrity, go toward the the um, attention, everyone likes to be loved and admired, and, and that usually uh, is translated into how much money you make, you know, how, how many status symbols you have, and, and sometimes that can even be a status symbol or, or simply being admired, not necessarily money if you're an organizer, you know, whatever. So um, that, that's what John represents to me, is no agenda other than and it, it really keeps you honest, you know, to constantly check yourself against that and and how you also teach students and, and be a model of that, not just tell them, you, see, you know, this is the way you should think, but um, be that. And, um, so that that's my... Um, I, I can go on and on about John, but I, what I want to do is address that agenda of, of decolonization and liberation. And I don't know, um, I thought about several things to say, but I guess what's <coughs> most pressing on me and what I've been involved in in the last six years of my life um, is writing a book um, that's the hardest book I've ever written. And I love to write books. and I. It, it's been fairly easy in the past, but this is a book that I was asked to write by a publisher, Beacon Press, and I said, of course, that will be easy. It's a history of the United States from an indigenous, from the indigenous people's perspective. And it comes out of the people's history of the United States and Howard Zinn. It's the same publisher, Beacon Press. Um, before Howard died a couple of years ago, uh, he suggested to them that they have different perspectives on people's history, and so it's a part of a series. And he suggested me because I was always criticizing him for, you know, introducing this wonderful section on what happened to Native Americans and genocide, you know, perfectly politically correct, and then they disappear completely until, oh, Alcatraz. <laughs> well, what happened? You know, the 17th century, and, and then Jackson, out, I guess, you know, and then uh, Lyndon E, and then, you know, the, the, it, it's just barely mentioned. So I was always criticizing him and um, saying, in the revision, you should do this and that. So I think he got his revenge on me uh, by suggesting I write this book is really, really hard because it is such a negative, depressing story, the history of the United States. It is just, just no getting around it. I think it's Jody Bird that said, um, you can probably quote her better, or where is Alicia that he knows, um, that, that uh, the history of the United States is a crime scene. That's what she said, it's a crime scene. And so you have to do a procedural. <laughs> and when I finally settled on, you know, just how to write this as a procedural, um, is, you know, really taking it apart. But first, the first thing I had to do 